Pouncies and wonders in animation are painfully common. From down-to-earth character romps to high-concept action serials, a lot of good content gets left behind. In the streaming age heightened by a really bad pandemic, studios have doubled down on reboots, spin-offs, and continuations of familiar content to reverse-engineer franchise potential. There's a bunch of content out there, but a lot of it feels... familiar. Not necessarily the same, but like different shades of the same hue. It's easy to miss them, but once those single season runs hit, we really can run with them. Unless they're Canadian. Indeed, there is definitely a larger ratio of these up north, but that doesn't mean that they're any less worthy of attention. In fact, with everything considered, I'd say that there's no time like the present. So today, I gotta take you back to the ancient year of 2016, where TV animation was introduced to a hero who was short of height, tall of fight, and usually slept in a cave at night. This is the barbarically righteous world of Fangbone. Fangbone started out as a series of graphic novels written by Michael Rex. One of the books had made its way into a child of a Disney XD Canada executive who was so dazzled by the book that they became dead set on porting the series to TV. Puppetry faithful radical She Productions hopped on as a major producer and got Mercury Filmworks involved with animating a pilot. Paired up with a contest to mold the series' aesthetic, the pilot aired as a TV special to decent reception, so after another two years of grinding, a full season was produced and aired throughout North America. Though it felt like the series got good engagement in the States, its reruns burnt out faster than a neutron star. And today it lives on Netflix. In its country of origin, it airs on its native network at 4 in the morning. It probably still airs in reruns somewhere overseas, but generally it's uh, on the down low. So I think it deserves a, a tiny love bomb of acknowledgement that's been a bit overdue. I don't know what y'all typically drink when you're consuming Saturday morning cartoons, but today I wanted to bring some coffee into the mix. And that'd be me. I am Coffee with Cartoons over on YouTube where I talk about cartoons that I like. Such as Fangbone, which I am very excited to show some major love for with the Wacky Deli. Today, I and the host of the Coffee with Cartoons channel will lovingly dissect Fangbone for all it's worth and go over m many of the reasons why we both enjoy the show today. Now, Getting into the mind of a high-energy barbarian is not easy work, so in order to really top this video off, I sat down with one of the folks who keeps this character alive in his most visceral form. Hello, Battle Brothers! It is I, Fangbone! Foul beast! I will- <laughs> And it is I, Taylor. Ha! Try harder, Porky Penguin! <laughs> And I am very confused about who I really am. All right. Uh, well, obviously, again, thank you for coming aboard, um, <laughs> joining us now. And uh, it's really cool to have you on board. One has to wonder how uh, I would come into such a meeting. I and mean, the chances of us actually sitting down for this little interview was quite incidental. But planning, I, I figured there'd be no better advocate for the show than the voice of said title character. Every blue moon I'll sprinkle in some additional insights we came across, but for the most part we're just speaking from the heart here. But to really address it properly, we have to establish the concept for what it is. What is Fangbone, really? Fangbone is a barbarian child from the realm of Skolbania, and with the help of his friend Bill, they protect the big toe of the evil wizard, Venomous Drool who, with his toe back, would have the magic needed to take over Skolbenia once again. When Drool managed to retrieve all of his broken up body parts after the inhabitants of Skolbenia chopped him up and divided his parts after his evil reign over the land ended, save for his big toe, the mighty wizard clan sends one of their strongest warriors, Fangbone, to Earth, where Drool himself is not able to go without his full power, to protect it. 
on Earth, he meets Bill Goodwin by chance. They get off to a bit of a rocky start, but thanks to Bill's quick thinking and compassion, they become battle brothers quickly, and have fought alongside each other to protect the Toe from Drool's evil forces ever since. Fangbone and Bill's relationship is uniquely balanced, because despite first appearances, the feeble Earth child is not only able to keep up with the trained barbarian prodigy, but also hold his own against monsters constantly trying to kill him and his friend. Fangbone is skilled and knowledgeable in combat, sword wielding, hunting, and Skulbanian legend slash history, all of which are extremely useful when it comes to things such as fighting Skulbanian beasts and surviving in a strange new world without parents or guardians. What doesn't he have, though? He doesn't know much about Earth or its ways. He is shown on multiple occasions that leading is not a talent he possesses, and he is more of a slash first, ask questions later kind of guy, meaning that his planning and strategic skills really ain't there. But it's all right, because all of those happen to be areas that Bill exceeds in. Bill is an Earth child, so it's a given he understands Earth just as well as Fangbone knows Skulvania, but is also a quick and creative thinker who can take in his surroundings and information on their attackers and use it against them. Along with his quick problem-solving skills, Bill is also great with people. He is very compassionate and always ready to talk things out given the chance. Which not only makes him a very competent leader, but also helps avoid misunderstandings with his blunt battle brother. But the icing on the cake of their friendship is how serendipitous it was. You see, as the viewer, we only learned of how the duo met in the second to last episode in flashback form where it's revealed that the Battle Brothers were not chosen to fight alongside each other, or even to protect the Toe. There was no prophecy where this red head on Earth was seen in a bubbly cauldron, no oracle telling Fangbone who he could trust with his life. Nope. Just Bill being a friendly and open person to this oddball who tried to attack him over a severed toe. I could even take it a step further in saying that Fangbone decided his own fate from the very beginning, when he accepted the mission tasked to him by his clan. For a show that brings up destiny and fate so much, it's actually very interesting how everything about them, from how they met to becoming battle brothers, to even finally defeating Drool, were all founded on their own decisions and choices. No fate or magical prophecy involved or needed. Just a destiny of their own creation. And that kind of unique balance leads to some very interesting action. The action in Fangbone is an unexpected draw. That's probably not how you typically see an action comedy featuring a barbarian world, but the show's relationship to the more physical elements of the story is a tad more complex. You might have noticed by now, but the animation is not exactly the most fluid or dynamic. I wouldn't say it's unfitting or not up to par, but for a series like this, you'd perhaps expect more of a focus on it in terms of design and functionality. Granted, I think it did more with its action sequences than the average Canadian animated action comedy would, but obviously something like Korgoth or Samurai Jack's got it beat in composition or dramatic timing. In general, Fangbone benefits from the fast-paced energy of its action. It doesn't lend itself to the type of sequence you can meticulously break down beat for beat and analyze. That said, the high energy of the fights keeps the plots going in a satisfying way, Often the combatants are not exchanging hard blows, so when it slows down a bit to establish that finishing thrust into the belly of the beast, it doesn't feel like the pacing is shot. Given the nature of the main relationship at play, it's nice that the action is still a big part of the show. Even if the series does excel at those sentimental, dialogue-heavy moments, they wouldn't begrudge the audience of a good time. I think the lack of a presence from Drool and 99% of the action makes these out to be fun bouts of carnage more than anything else. The prospect of fighting evens out the characters almost as much as the hard emotional substance does. Of course, if the advent of Aaron Danger wasn't an issue, we wouldn't get to see the best of these guys when pushed to their limits. Good characters that can literally roll with the punches don't exactly grow on trees. But for this show, it feels like a lot of them are stronger than you'd think. Fangbone is loud, brash, caring, loyal, and smart by barbarian standards. He is an exceptional friend to Bill. In one episode, he thought Bill looked cold and ill, 
so he learned how to knit and knitted him over a hundred sweaters until he made one he thought was good enough to give to him. Super sweet. Fangbong grew a lot from his time on Earth, which I think is best exemplified in his love of art. When he discovers his love for art, he tries to reject it, artists not being respected in Skullbanian culture, but eventually comes to terms with the fact that he is just as much an artist as he is a barbarian, and uses it to his advantage. Fangbone was a fun and unexpectedly flexible title character, with unique motivations and interests, and well, I just think he's neat. Bill was by far my personal favorite character, surprising me with his decisions, people skills, and overall competence. Bill is so many things, including compassionate and a conversationalist. He's great at picking out people's strong areas and planning strategies accordingly, which plays a big part in what makes him such a great leader. Maybe you're a different kind of hero. You know, Fangbone is the hit things with a sword kind. Yes, and Bill hits things with his brain. He loves his mom openly, having a whole episode revolve around getting her a nice birthday present. Since meeting Fangbone, he has become braver, learned how to sword fight, and that myths and facts may be more intertwined than he had inherently believed. Fangbone and Bill were fast friends, and throughout the season, we watched the two rub off on each other in big and small ways, become more comfortable, and understand each other. Truly, the chemistry and balance of this duo is impeccable. Dibby is definitely my favorite classmate. He is constantly role-playing a robot, wants to be a hero like Fangbone and Bill, and is the only classmate to get an entire episode centered around them. Eddie is the hoodie all the time kid who likes karate. Patty is a certified glitter fiend. She's ferocious and gives pep talks to the class and isn't afraid to stand up to Fangbone. Also, she is a weird fling with a younger clone of Drool. She makes me think of if Mabel, Candy, and Grenda were all rolled into the same person. She's unhinged, is what I'm trying to say. Robert, unfortunately, just likes to take his clothes off. Stacy is the bully-esque character in the sense that she makes sick burns from time to time and has bodybuilder-like strength, which is exemplified by how she simply just beats the shit out of Porky Penguin in the episode Leg of Broken. Selena has a ponytail. As you could have told, the classmates are definitely unbalanced as far as character lore goes, but I'd like to blame that on a lack of season two to expand more on them. Venomous Drool is the big baddie with Thanos-level power and Doofenshmirtz-level competence. He's whiny and forgettable for the amount of screen time he takes up, but is legitimately scary when he reminds us how powerful he is. Like when he basically won and turned everyone into goats. Or when he sends Fangbone to barbarian hell. He's a wizard who was cast out of the lizard clan for being an ugly baby, and was adopted by giant snails. He was self-taught in wizardry, and then dipped his toe in Morg's puddle of pure evil, which gave him enough power to take over Skulvania, until the Battle of Drul Narok, where for the only time in history, the barbarian clans all came together, and managed to defeat Drul. They then cut up his body and divided it among the clans. A thousand years later, his minions have pieced him back together, except of course for his hella evil and powerful toe. Nathalie Goodman is Bill's mom, and the two have some really sweet moments throughout the season. She gives great advice to Bill, along with unfunny and mostly waffle-based jokes. She is very caring, fun, and lovable right from the start, and that would have been enough to make her a great mom character in my book. But then there was a whole episode dedicated to seeing what it would have been like if she had the toe as a kid instead of Bill and what kind of person she would have been without Bill as her son, and in an apocalyptic setting, and with a sick robot arm! Truly, a surprisingly rounded and awesome character. Miss Jillian tends to jump from hating her life to being a kind of peppy teacher. She gets a lot of weird, gross jokes, like the farting when she gets kidnapped, and playing with Axe Bear's snot, and don't even get me started about the pilot when she's got all that slime coming out of her ears. Overall, she is usually pretty funny and a good balance to the optimistic, rowdy kids in her class. Principal Bruce is the always smiley principal with a bag full of catchphrases, 
who everyone walks all over, except for that one episode where he goes mad with power. That's fun. Sid is the daughter of the head of the Shadow Steppers clan. When she first shows up with her piercings and side cut and cool kid attitude, I honestly didn't know what to make of her. But by the second and definitely third appearance, she really cemented herself as being more than she first appears. She is shown not to get along with the other Shadow Steppers and seems to prefer the freedom of life on Earth. Slowly throughout the show, she becomes a sort of third man to Fangbone and Bill's duo. And by the end of the last episode, it seems like she's there to stay. Which would have been so fun to see in season two. Could you imagine all the shenanigans and character growth that would have came from this sort of change in dynamic? Ah, if only. The Duck of Always came so out of left field and hit so goddamn hard. Once just a normal duck, until he ate the grape of always and became immortal. He has lived for centuries and would do anything for it to cease. Which is why when we first meet him, he's working for Drool, whom promised to lift his curse if he hands over the toe. His voice is deep and sorrowful, and so much more dramatic than needed for this cartoon, but also so perfect for the character. And also, what a motivation for a cartoon as well, to be motivated to die. But then Bill, ever the problem solver, suggests the duck continue living on Earth, a vast new world that would take him more centuries to explore. Truly a very heartwarming and fitting ending, along with the addition of a powerful ally. The Mighty Lizard Clan is Fangbone's barbarian clan. Axbear is their leader, a large, strong, but not so nice or thinky kind of guy. Twinklestick is the clan's wizard and will act as a sort of encyclopedia of knowledge for the boys. He's wacky and pretty incompetent, but he definitely grew on me. The Shadow Steppers are a clan of thieves that do not get along with the Lizard Clan. Something that makes Fangbone and Sid's dynamic more interesting. There was even an infamous Shadow Stepper Lizard Clan war in the not so distant past. However, in the second to last episode, they actually do make amends thanks to Fangbone and Bill's efforts. Of course, though, interesting characters aren't much without the animation and design that bring them to life. As previously established, the quality of the animation is fairly middle of the road. It's not terribly dynamic for a series that leads harder into the action, but it's both functional and enjoyable. For as simplistic as the walk cycles and other movements may appear, they want the extra mile to pack each character to the gills with expression. I'm impressed with how many they were able to squeeze in. I think the faster pace here is harder to maintain without losing control of the entities being animated, and they pull it off quite well when it's utilized. Looking briefly at the style, the books, the art style was definitely rounded out and streamlined to acquiesce to the simplicity of the digital pipeline. The animation for season one was done by Pipeline Studios, the same guys in charge of animating shows like Sidekick, Grossology, Stoked, and at points, season one of Star vs. the Forces of Evil. Now, those series have varying points of fluidity to accommodate their differing styles and everything. Something like Grossology seems slower and better paced due to its lineless glory, and like work on Star as to match the frenetically fluid standard Mercury had set. Fangbone likely had the most in common with something like Sidekick, an angular action comedy about literal superhero sidekicks. Stylistically employs a more choppy movement to emphasize the more dramatic expressions and poses. The background and character design do their jobs well. Everyone's simplified designs make it easier to distinguish which side everyone's on. It's cool seeing the forward progression of the development work. I didn't expect for everything to be so... collaborative. It's quite often when the TV folks take many of the reins and the originators take a back seat. By Canadian standards, Fangbone was an expensive show, but but the passion behind it, I think, shows through and makes it a show that I'm really proud of. And even if, you know, sometimes you're like, oh man, I, why did they use that take? Or um, that that shot looks a little cheap somehow, you know? Um, <laughs> you know, there's always a bit of a learning curve and there's always like people fighting within the confines that, that they've been given. Obvious shape language would come into play, but a lot of the monsters tend to have really angular, pointy, 
The off-putting designs, all the characters native to Earth have more rounded, bouncy traits. The SFX work was also pretty tight. I like the way the dimensional rifts were integrated. It really made it feel like they were tearing through reality. The characterization of Fangbone's charges is arguably its biggest strength. The character in and of himself is balanced well by the smaller cast around him, but the authenticity of his interactions is what keeps the show memorable. It would be easy for the writing to fall into the similar pitfalls and make everyone a bit more snarky, a bit more irritating, or in your face. The premise requires a bit more suspension of disbelief from the ones part of the story rather than the audience, but they take it in stride. It wouldn't be half as fun if they weren't so accommodating to each other. Even if you were conflicted on the enjoyability of, say, the classmates as I was, it's still plain to see that they are a net positive for Fangbone and his quest. Not because of what they do, but because of how well they regard him. The strength of the dialogue, or the veracity of the relationships, also carries over to help advance the story. Honestly, one of my favorite Fangbone lines never made an episode. I When I watched it, I was like, what, they cut that? What? <laughs> And it was, um, there's, there's a plane going by, I think it was in like the Stoneback episode, and plane going by and he just goes, CURSE YOU METAL VACATION BIRDS! <laughs> <laughs> As an uncommon occurrence for series of its ilk, Fangbone does have positive continuity and natural story progression throughout the whole season. Neither of us have finished the original books, but I'd imagine that these attributes were carried over directly. The author did have an active footprint on production of the series wholesale, which likely helped preserve the appeal of the books. It's a particular case where even if you watch most of the run out of order, you probably wouldn't feel like you skipped a beat. Now a common reaction to the show at large would be to compare it to uh, the aforementioned Disney classic Star vs. the Forces of Evil. One may also be quick to brush off such a comparison. People were like, oh, it's so similar to Star vs. I was like, well, yes. Fangbone was technically first. Um, <laughs> technically. That. I think. <laughs> Beyond the premises of the overpowered young one crossing over into Earth from a faraway land to fight monsters, there's arguably not much else tying it back. The especially bitter could reason that a theoretical ending Fangbone might have been heading towards would have outshone the polarizing star finale, but they'd be thinking way too many steps ahead for most to see that possibility through. Now as for Taylor... Whoa! The pacing of the show was good, meaning I didn't really think about it much. Every episode starts with a clear conflict or two, moving to the middle part where they have to face some sort of internal struggle or conflict before they can defeat the external one, usually that one being some sort of monster. They beat it and learn a lesson. The end. And as simple as that may sound, it works and is flexible enough to lend itself to many different kinds of stories. Including the kind of story the last couple of episodes had to tell. In the beginning of the two-part season finale, there is a disembodied woman's voice who is the catalyst for the episode's events. She speaks to both Fangbone and Drool, pushing them in the direction she wants, which is to have Drool make a world chain to bring Skulbania and Earth together, which would let him walk up to the boys and take the toe back himself. Fangbone, Bill, and Sid get to the chain to cut it with the magic sword they got in the last episode, but then the voice makes Fangbone hesitate, and he doesn't cut it in time. And so Drool succeeds in combining both worlds and gets his toe back. All hope seems lost. The trio runs away and makes a plan. They convince all of their friends, teachers, and allies they made over the season to help them defeat Drool while he's still looking for Bill and Fangbone. After a cool speech from Fangbone where they pan over all of their allies, a few of which don't actually show up in the battle scene, they all charge in. And after the battle was over, they had cut off his toe again. The toe and the rest of Drool's magic, though, it seemed, had both gone missing. Our heroes assumed they were destroyed in the battle. They think everything's gone back to normal. But in a perfectly setting up season two explanation of how their worlds are still dangerously close and magical rifts can open at any time from Twinkle Stick, puts that to rest pretty quick. 
In the last scene, the voice is revealed to be the Toe itself, who seems to have taken Drool's hideout and minions as well as growing a mascara-heavy eye. This ending was full of callbacks, feels, and great dramatic and inspiring dialogue. And just like the show itself, really blew my expectations out of the water. All right, everybody, signing off, this has been Coffee with Cartoons. I'd like to give a great big thank you to Deli for having me. It's been super fun. And hey, I hope you all have a great day. Before we proceed to the bitter end, just uh, a quick plug. She's a very quick plug. Basically, I've got two spots left in a voice acting intensive that I'm leading called the Intertune Intensive. I've been leading a ton of voice acting uh, events and things out of my recording studio here over the years. Um, but yeah, this intensive is kind of the culmination of it. So it's for people who are really serious about the silly world of voice acting. Um, and I've got a special guest near the end of it, uh, Susan Hart, who is a very acclaimed voice acting director here in Canada and actually directed me in Fangbone back in the day. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there's only two spots left for that intensive. If you'd like to register, then uh, the, the, the man of Delhi who is wacky will, will, leave a, uh, will leave a link below, I believe. Of course. Um, yeah, sweet. I, I guess that's all there is to say. You know, ideally be in Toronto because it would be great to uh, be able to meet you in person for the last couple of sessions. Most of it, it, it can all be over Zoom if you want, but it'd be also awesome uh, if you're in the city because I can give you two uh, private sessions here in my studio. Fangbone is a pretty satisfying trip. Unexpectedly, it challenged expectations of its ilk and genre, and without knowing much of the source material, it does pull you into the story and compel you to get sucked right into the mythos. It really does put you in a funk thinking of all the cool stuff they were going to execute in a prospective season 2. In the grand scheme of things, this might appear like another Canadian one-hit wonder that I have decided to overhype out of nostalgic bias. How would one easily pick this one out from the full slate of acquisitions the big three took on throughout the 21st century without the help of the good old rose-colored glasses? It doesn't have a long run or a merch cycle, not even as big a fan base as one might believe. But undoubtedly, and as cliche as it is, Fangbone has a lot of heart. Everything about it from start to finish was very clearly a labor of love that was expected to soar past expectations and kick all ass. Even if it didn't travel as far as we would have expected for a project of its size, its unique stylings is why we're able to easily look back on it today. Whether just through a good viewing experience or a more radical sense of self, the characters clearly have left their mark. By the end of our conversation, the three of us weren't any less unsure of the series future or the landscape of the current industry. I think that if, if it was produced purely in the States, or even if it was uh, some kind of co-production like you see with something like Hilda where that's kind of a mix of a Canadian and of this and of that then it would have had the opportunity to get that extra season while yes we're just here to do a job it's like it's a it's a beautiful privilege and we and we take it we take it very seriously and and if you give us a show that has a soul and characters that have soul and and something something special and something exciting about this whole thing and it doesn't feel like it's just you know made to meet a canadian quota then then you know we're gonna throw ourselves into it and it's like a, it's like losing a losing a baby a little bit um i i think it turned out really well and, and i'm genuinely proud of it and i in the midst of current year shenanigans everything's a bit more uncertain now more than ever but assuredly as biased as we may have been there was a feel that this one would live on indefinitely, resounding throughout the clans of Skullbania and beyond. Well, one thing I did was, uh, to illustrate how different it was, I, I sang a little thing as Fangbone. I think I just sent it to the producers. One other thing is that I, I made this messed up version of the closing theme for Star. Uh, just to show the, the producers and people um, and make it so clear how different Fangbone is. So I think it went, 
I think that Earth is a green and docile place, my second home, though I admit it is rather strange. Humans use pillows and metal vacation birds. Why can't I ever seem to find a gore cow herd? I think that strangers are just things I have not slain. Son of Mom and Bill and I keep the toe of drool in our possession. I dream about watching all his minions implode. <laughs>